it's it's a pleasure today i have to do again a pleasant task of introducing our first or the, uh, the keynote speaker of this day uh, dr r a mashilkar of course no one needs introduction rather known uh, uh, professor mashilkar doesn't need introduction i would say uh, but still i'll just go through his profile before we in invite him to give his address um Dr. R. A. Mashilkar is a National Research Professor and President of Global Research Alliance. He is former Director of CSIR and former President of Indian National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Mashilkar is Fellow of Royal Society (FRS), Foreign Associate of U.S. National Academy of Science. and also national academy of engineering associate foreign member american academy of arts and sciences fellow of royal academy of engineering uk he is fellow of us national academy of inventors the first ever indian to be elected for this fellowship he is currently the chairman of india's national innovation foundation Reliance Innovation Council, KPIT Technology Innovation Council, Persistent Systems Innovation Council, and Marico Foundation Governing Council. He co-chairs the Maharashtra State Innovation Council. Now I don't know whether you've got a chance to read today's newspaper. There's a headline in Maharashtra Times, and there's a news item in Times of India as well. about uh, state government's startup policy and uh, it mentions the contribution of dr mashelkar as a co-chair in formulating this particular scheme dr mashelkar has played a critical role in shaping india's science and technology institutions and also policies he was a member of scientific advisory committee to prime minister for last 3 decades 38 universities around the world have honored him honorary doctorates and lastly very important the president of india honored dr mashelkar with padma shri 1991 Padma Bhushan 2000 and Padma Vibhushan 2014. So we are extremely lucky. <laughs> so we are extremely lucky to have a person of his stature coming here and addressing as a keynote speaker for the second day of this particular symposium. Thank you very much. I invite uh, Dr. Mashelkar. Floor is yours, sir. Professor Majani, for those uh, very kind words, it's always thrilling to be here in this great institution. So Devang, it's wonderful to see you. I was here just a couple of weeks ago, so good things have to be repeated. So I'm <laughs> repeating good things. It's wonderful to be amongst uh, all of you. Uh, innovation is a subject that is very close to my heart. I always said I in India must stand for innovation, not inhibition. not imitation and i'm very happy that we are on that path now that's uh, really wonderful uh this center uh, the creation of which actually i think is a sort of major milestone uh, must uh, acknowledge uh, our friend ratan tata for thinking of uh, creating this center and he could not have created it at a better place than i t i think that's uh, fantastic uh what i'm going to do today is to talk about what i like to call as assured and i will explain what is assured as we move along uh to me that is going to be the game changing innovation paradigm 
achieving so many things at the same time, including the theme that we have here, you know, wait to tell song. Real disruptive transformations can take place if we follow what is called as assured, which I will introduce. Innovation, where does India stand? That's the first question. So there are indicators, of course, where, yeah. So where do we stand as far as uh, uh, innovation is concerned? So there is what is called as a global innovation index, as we know, which measures, uh, I mean, which gives ranking among 141 uh, countries. And India's innovation rank, I'm going to give you some bad news to start with, but my lectures will always have a good news at the end, so don't worry. So first, the bad news. The bad news is our rank was 62 in 2011, but worse was to follow, 64 the following year. Then the worst was to follow, 66. Then 76, and then 81. Not something to be proud about. Why is it that that rank kept on falling? Are we not investing more? Aren't the governments making better and better policies? Yes, of course we are. Still, why are we falling? So you must understand that when you are running, it is not your speed that matters. It is the competitor's speed that matters. So we are running, but other nations are running faster. And having given the bad news, now the good news. 2016, we jumped from 81 to 66, and the following year to 60. Does it mean that in two years, we have suddenly become innovative? No. What has happened is that the measures that are used for Global Innovation Index, they underwent change. I happen to be a member of their International Advisory Board. And I told them that what counts doesn't get counted, and what is counted doesn't count, as far as this index is concerned. Because there was a very narrow definition in terms of technology, all right, and measurable parameters whether they are patterns, and so on, so forth, etc. Patterns are not everything, okay? So you measure what is measurable. But I said, what about non-technological innovation, business model innovation, workflow innovation, system delivery innovation, which can be transformative, basically, all right? I said, our Mars Orbiter mission, we did in $74 million. US did it in $671 million. Tenfold, 10x, all right? And we are both around Mars. Where does it count? Isn't that, that innovation? So they were trying to find some proxies and all that, and we made major changes in those. And part of the reason why we have risen is also that real innovation. And I mean, people talk about frugal innovation, right? And the word is following, I mean, we have changed the dictionary of innovation. The words frugal innovation, reverse innovation, etc., or inclusive innovation, or more from less for more, etc., they didn't exist. We have changed the dictionary by doing uh, whatever we have. So I think that has made a big difference, and I will look forward to what happens in 2018, by the way. And I will like this index to go up, not because the indicators are changing, but we are changing. And I will talk about what changes we need to make in order to make a difference. I think India's big challenge is journey from mind to marketplace. In terms of ideas, no issue at all. Fantastic. But how do we finally reach the marketplace? How do you do that journey? I think that is where our challenge is. We are great in launching products, by the way. Okay? I'll show you photographs. And invariably, ministers do that. Here is one. Simputer was launched. Great product by Dr. Murli Manozoshi, who was then the Minister of Science and Technology. Wonderful. Another launch. Mr. Kapil Sibal, Minister of Science and Technology. You can see me there. I was Secretary 
Department of Scientific Industry Research and Director General of CSR. This was a program under our New Millennium Indian Technology Leadership Initiative. And you can see Vinaydesh Pandey. I had given a challenge, $2,000 laptop, can you do it in $200, right? And we launched it. Wonderful launch. And of course, you are familiar with this. You are involved. IIT Bombay was involved. Akash, right? So one launch, second launch, third launch. What has happened? Basically, launches don't matter. This is what matters. Finally, the product has to be in the hand of a consumer. In this particular case, these young children for whom it was supposed to matter. So what is the challenge of this journey from mind to marketplace? That's what I think is the big issue. And that is where we have to go for assured innovation. Assured means the mind to marketplace journey is assured. And for that, what is the breakup of A-S-S-U-R-E-D? Each word, I mean each letter has a meaning. First, A. It has to be affordable. Okay, we are talking about 1.3 billion people and large population. So I think therefore we can't be creating products which certain section of the society will benefit. Every Indian matters and every Indian must benefit from that. So it has to be affordable. Secondly, it has to be scalable. No use doing something which benefits 10 people, 100 people, 1000 people. 10 million, 100 million has to be the kind of scale. Third, it has to be sustainable. Otherwise, it will not survive. Sustainable in three senses. First is economic. You can't uh, run a business by having government subsidies support you for year after year. Okay? So therefore, you have to have kind of standalone profitable business. The second is environmental. Because if it is environmentally not sustainable, like when you say affordable, the plastic pouches are affordable. But are they environmentally sustainable? They are not. Okay, so we need to worry about that. And the third one is social. Socially acceptable, socially sustainable. Because if society rejects the product, then the business cannot be sustainable. The next is universal, and by that I mean user friendly, really. Things which you can do maintenance free and so on and so forth. The more complicated it becomes, the more difficult it is. The next is rapid, speed. Speed, scale and sustainability. These three have to go together all the time. You fail on one and you lose the business. Third is excellence. Now you will say, what is he doing? On the top he is saying affordable and here he is saying excellence. Affordable excellence, come on. That's a contradiction in terms. Because what is affordable can't be excellent. What is excellent cannot be affordable. And the one that was exactly the title of my talk, the convocation address that I was privileged to give three years ago here. Affordable excellence. Right? And I will demonstrate to you how affordability and excellence can go together as we sort of move forward. And the last one is distinctive. We tinker around and create me too products. They have no chance to survive. And therefore, distinctive and hopefully disruptive. Hopefully game changing. All right? That requires some radical thinking. Now, I'll take you through several cases on how some of these uh, can be uh, sort of important, not only on their own, but in combination. And bulk of the time you'll find it is the scalability and sustainability where we fail. We create affordable, we create universal, we create rapid, we create excellent, we create distinctive, but they don't scale and they don't sustain. What are the reasons for that? And in order to make that big change, we have to also make a big change in the way we do things. So I always like to talk about mantras, five mantras, very easy to remember. But they will be distinctively different than whatever we are doing today in India. The first is lift rock to pole vault. 
and I'll explain to you what I mean by that. The second is from Jugaad to systematic innovation. I'm not very fond of the word Jugaad. I don't like my India to be called a Jugaadu nation. I'm sorry. Jugaad is doing it somehow. Cost is the only consideration. Not safety, not environmental sustainability, not aesthetics, nothing. So that's not the way. How do we move to systematic innovation? The next is best practice to next practice. We are very fond of saying we are doing the best practice. Devang, that means we are following somebody's current best practice. Are, come on, we have to do the next practice. We should show the world that we are moving to the next practice. And the last one is from incremental to disruptive. Not 10%. People call me a 10x guy. I always say do 10 times better but at 10 times lower cost. Not 10% better at 10% lower cost. You say come on, crazy. I will show you how it can be done. These five demand are mantras which will move India from that 62 rank to the top five. Right? But that requires a huge change in terms of the mindset, risk taking and so on and so forth. And I'll take you through that. First, let's talk about leaf frog. Do you know why a frog leaps? Because he's afraid of a predator. Do you know what is the average that he leaps? 4.6 feet. Do you know what is the world record? 7 feet. So here is leaf frogging. Because you are afraid of a predator, you are jumping 7 feet. Is that what you want in India? Rather than that, you have to have pole wall. What does the pole vault do? The pole vault, the size of the pole is the size of your aspiration. Take a thousand meter pole and you can cross continents basically. Can we do that? I think that is the basic issue. I chair the Reliance Innovation Council for the last 10 years. We have uh, Nobel laureate John Merrillen, Nobel laureate Bob Grubbs. Charles White says from Harvard. C.K. Pralad used to be a member. He's no more. And so on. And we always think in terms of those five mantras, by the way. And in one of the discussions with Mukesh Ambani, we said we must uh, uh, sort of uh, pole vault to a new level of ambition, new level of ambition. And we have an innovation uh, uh, leadership center uh, through which we create uh, uh, innovation uh, uh, leaders, all right? We have something like two and a half lakh employees. We just pick up some 25, 30, and for them, we have created this program called Beyonders. These are the people who are able to go beyond the reams of possibility, right? So here, for example, is an example on how these things can be achieved. Look at uh, the uh, mobile data transmission in terms of million GB per month. This is where India was in comparison to the rest of the country. This was about three months ago. Launch of Geo has moved it to number one position. Now US is second and China is third. This is not leapfrogging. This is pole vaulting to the first place. Okay. More importantly, what you see, if you look at the number of years it took to reach uh, 50 million users, telephone took 50 years, mobile took 12 years, YouTube took 4 years, Facebook took 3 years, Twitter took 2 years, right? And we would always look at these tables, teach our students how they did it and all that, but this is all happening there. Now you can add something more. Look at this. 83 days. Now you say, how was it done? Well, the onboarding time used to be around five days. It was reduced to five minutes. How? Because there's a platform of Aadhaar and a mobile. And some of you who must have onboarded, you must have experienced that, basically. Of course, without those technology platforms, it would not have been possible. But using that, Today, this is what one has been able to create. That is exactly the spirit that I'm talking about. 
basically, you know. How do we build that spirit? To me, what is more important is this, by the way. We used to take pride in miss call. I did not used to take pride in miss call for a simple reason that you are not paying for a miss call. Some telephone company is paying. You are getting the benefit, the cost is borne by somebody else. That's not my idea of innovation. But for miss call, now we have moved to free voice call. Dirbhai Ambani had said, phone call at the cost of a postcard. You remember that? And it's not even cost of a postcard. Now free voice call. And most importantly now, 5 rupees per GB video call. Can you just imagine what it means? You know, I was talking to somebody on the other day. What does 5 rupees per GB video call mean? Their old mother, widowed, let's say in Mumbai, her son is at the border. Okay? She can talk to him and see him every day. Her family. Can you imagine what it does to the spirit of that young man? Basically. Okay? That is the societal change that you are talking about. Basically. That has all become possible because of the systematic innovation. Let's move from Jugad to systematic innovation. Well, here is a challenge. There are five customers who want tea and they want it at the same time. And you have only one kettle. Okay? You don't have five people to serve. How do you do that? I think the whole world will be puzzled, but not India. India has a solution. So that is in Indian genes, by the way. Because scarcity on one hand and aspiration on the other hand is a terrific combination. So you do find a solution. But this is still not regard because it doesn't meet the criteria that we talked about assured. Affordable? Yes, it is. But not the rest. Okay? So that is where, as my friend uh, Krishnan said, we must move from Jugad to systematic innovation. And how do we actually do that? And that's what we are doing. When we talk about Mars orbiter mission, not 74 million, but 671, that's what is happening. And uh, ISRO launches 104 satellites in a single mission, which is a world record. So serving five customers at the same time at a ground level, that is in our genes, and also launching 104 missiles at the same time, that is also in our genes. You got to systematic innovation. How do we do more of it? I think is the challenge. So this is assured. Then we move from best practice to next practice. Okay? Is it possible? And I'm taking you through live examples, by the way. This is not theory. This has actually happened. Uh, in my mother's name, I have created what is called as an Anjani Mashelkar Inclusive Innovation Award. Uh, the reason I created it was very simple. I uh, remember <laughs> uh, her constant uh, this thing to me that you are a scientist, do something for the poor and so on and so forth. So we create, uh, created this award, but it is inclusive innovation award, where the benefits of innovation will uh, reach uh, uh, the last person. One award went to uh, Mishkin Ingawale. He created this 10 rupees hemoglobin test. I think some of you may be aware of his work. The other one, Rahul Rastogi, just 5 rupees for an ECG. And dollar one for breast cancer screening. These were the three consecutive awards. This is the seventh year of the award. Now, the basic uh, issue is we have to move from best practice to next practice because these awards are not given for best practice. They are given for next practice. So, supposing you are talking about ECG, what is the best practice? Best practice is this: you lie down. There are leads. Right? And so there is a nurse, and then you take a printout, and so on and so forth. What is the next practice? He created this next practice. It is here. Okay? Half the size of a smartphone. So, you put your two fingers like this for 15 seconds. There is a sensor. Okay? There are prescribed positions. One, two, three, above the heart. One, two, three, 
below the heart. And if you have downloaded uh, an app called Sanket, which I have on my smartphone, you know, within three minutes, the ECG will reach there, basically. So basically what one is doing is here. Personal 12 lead ECG event monitor, portable credit card size, five rupees cost per ECG. And the way it works is uh, like this. Uh, download the free mobile app, touch Sanket with thumbs, get ECG, and then it gets transmitted by email. Okay. Now here you will find a affordable yes, you, you universal unique simple because this is like using a thermometer, isn't it? Yes, R rapid yes within three minutes. E excellence yes. He has used a cutting edge technology by the way, in order to make it happen. It is mainly software, not hardware by the way. D distinctive yes. The challenge is S and S. Scalable. Sustainable? No. Now, since we talk about Tata's, I must also say the role that Tata Trust played in this. We gave him the award, Devang, when it was a six lead. But to me, six lead is no good. It has to be the best, 12 lead. So I said, Rahul, how much money it will take to create Sanket 2.0? He said, 46 lakhs. And I remember Tata Trust had invited me. My dear friend Venkat was there. And I told him about this, you know, and what difference it can make, actually. Can you imagine 46 lakh was agreed to in 48 hours? And that is how he was able to create now the 12 lead one. Okay. Why has it not scaled up so far? There are a number of uh, uh, reasons for that. We are taking steps. I've introduced him to Apollo, and uh, they are now post uh, heart surgery monitoring, etc., etc. It is getting into it but it has not caught speed. I hope that scale will be there. Anybody who wants to, by the way, buy this, uh, just put Sanket and go on the web and uh, you can buy it. Actually, there's no uh, sort of challenge at all, but we have a long way to go. The next one, best practice, next practice, invasive with mammography as far as cancer is concerned, breast cancer, non-invasive, no mammography, painful, Painless. Cost per scan, dollar hundred. Year cost per scan, dollar one. Requires specialist, no specialist. So from best practice to best practice. This looks like a dream. But this has happened. Young Mir Shah has done it. How has he done it? The IBRS exam, it's a low cost uh, tactile sensor that measures tissue stiffness, difference in real time, non invasively and without pain. It is ultra portable, accurate minimal training. In fact, a public health worker can sort of use it, wireless and cloud connected. Has it scaled? That is the challenge. And of course, instant results. This is one that has scaled. You can see it here. What has happened is that there is a partnership with GE Healthcare now, basically, that was launched uh, in November, mid-November. You can see Karan Mazumdar Shah supporting him very strongly. Now they will be going to 25 plus countries and 500 million women. That's the scale that we are talking about. So here I would say it is affordable, scalable, sustainable, universal, right? rapid, excellence in technology, and distinctive. Okay, That marks the success. So we are doing a case study of all the seven awardees of Anjani Vashilkar Inclusive Innovation Award. And why is it that there? Yeah. And we should do the same studies for the incumbents that we have, basically. Because I saw your beautiful booklet. And in that booklet, there is so much of innovation that is done. Please use this matrix now, not later, to see what is missing. And then the question is, how can we use this matrix to make sure that they become successful? Then, of course, the next one, incremental to disruptive innovation. Now, this disruption, by the way, is the order of the day, change. And why is it? Because there are 10 exponential technologies that are causing disruption. 
The first is Internet of Things, second is Artificial Intelligence, Machine Learning, Deep Learning, third is Robotics Process Automation, the fourth is Virtual Reality, uh, uh, Augmented Reality, Mixed Reality, the next is Sensors, 3D Printing, 3D Visualization, uh, Mobile Internet and Cloud, Big Data Analytics, Open Data and finally Blockchain. These are the 10. What is happening here? What is happening here is, as you know, this Moore's law, you know, number of transistors doubling every two years. What it meant was that the annual improvement rate was around 41.4%. Okay? So exponential growth in terms of number of transistors, and you are very familiar with this figure. Now what has happened? is that there are other things where such exponential changes are taking place. When is data storage, just like Moore's law, there is a Crider's law. We say that the hard disk in dollars per bit will be down 50% every 18 months, even better than Moore's law. Second is digital imaging, Kendi's law. Pixels per dollar, 59% per year, even better than Moore's law. Third is network capacity. Butler's law of Fudanex, the dollar cost of transmitting a bit uh, decreased by 50% every nine months. And of course, lithium-ion batteries, they are dropping at a slower pace. But what does it mean? What is most significant is the rate of change. As you can see, it used to change, but rather slowly. Now you can see very rapidly. So it is this that is causing disruption, but it is not these as standalone, it's a combination. Each one of you have a smartphone. It's a combination of data storage, that is Grider's law, digital imaging, that is Hendy's law, network capacity, that is Butler's law of photonics, and of course, touch screen, lithium ion batteries, computing and sensors, and so on. So the point I'm trying to make is that when you talk about from incremental to disruptive innovation, how do you take these 10 exponential technologies whose costs are dropping so steeply and combine them in a very creative way in order to call the next disruption? Okay? The other point is that I have talked so far about technological innovation. But as I argued with World Economic Forum, that's not the end of the world. <coughs> For end-to-end -end innovation, you require, apart from technology innovation, business model innovation. You require system delivery innovation. You require workflow innovation. You require process innovation. You require organizational innovation. And most importantly, you require a policy innovation. A great technology can be killed simply because you don't have a supportive a sort of policy environment. And most of the time, when things have happened, it's a combination of these that have made them happen. Just to give you an example of mobile that each one of you carry. The first was the policy innovation, deregulation, okay, opening up. But the handset was $250. So even if you had opened up, if it was $250, nobody would have heard it. It was brought down to $25. That was technological innovation. Did we do it? No. Nokia, Ericsson, etc. But now I ask you, it was not $25, it was $0. Distributed freely. Would people have used it? No. Because the call rates were $0.10 cent per minute. $2 per day is your income. 20 minute call and you are gone. So that is where the business model innovation came. Alright? That is where phone call at the cost of a postcard, and then the air tail and so on. And this is covered in a paper by me and C.K. Prahlad in our paper, Innovation's Holy Grail, in uh, Harvard Business Review, by the way. Okay, so those of you are more interested. Come. So what is the point I'm trying to make? Policy combined with technology, combined with business model. If one of them was missing, you would not be having mobile phones in your pocket today, or a billion mobile will not be there in India today. So it's a combination. The combinatorial of technology and combinatorial 
of non-technological and how creatively you can actually integrate them to create the next practice. That is very important. Now, India has done it very well, I must say. I mean, look at uh, uh, the great Indian Innovation Combinatorium, JAN, Jandhan Yojana, that was policy. Aadhaar, a billion plus, and mobile, a billion plus. Okay, the three combined together. And we have now 300 million plus this thing. In fact, there's a Guinness Book of Records, by the way. Because uh, in a particular week in 2014, we created 18.6 million accounts. And that is a Guinness Book of Records, by the way. So can you imagine how, and you can now see, mobile, I told you what was the combinatorial, Aadhaar, again, technological, but also workflow innovation. To get a billion in five years is not a joke, by the way. And Pradhan Mantri Janadhan Yojana was a policy innovation. So it is a combination of all these which has created now these 30 crore plus accounts, so as to say. Let's uh, move on and talk about incremental to disruptive innovation. India is a master in this. Incremental is 10%, disruptive is tenfold. High quality hepatitis B vaccine, recombinant DNA based vaccine, by the way, 40 times cheaper, not 40%, Shanta Biotech, right? Not 40 times, 40%. And it has 40% share of the UNICEF uh, uh, market, I mean, uh, UNICEF supply, by the way. That means quality. High quality cataract eye surgery, 100 times cheaper, not 100%. Done by whom? Okay. Now, these are Arvind I care, you know, doing it, but doing what? Workflow innovation. They looked at McDonald, the assembly line approach, and distribution of work and workflow, depending upon the skills that are required to bring down the cost dramatically. Quality, yes, extraordinary. In fact, I have a table where I show nine parameters post-surgery and how in nine out of nine, they beat the Royal College of Ophthalmic Surgeons. Nine out of nine. High quality open heart surgery, 20 times cheaper, not 20%. Devi Shetty, again. And in Florida now, there is a hospital that is coming and other places it is getting high quality artificial food, 300 times cheaper, not 300%. Jaipur food. Normally, if I have time, I show a film where somebody with Jaipur food runs a kilometer in 4 minutes 30 seconds. And then I go around and ask how many of you can run in 4 minutes 30 seconds? Uh, how many of you can run in 40 minute, uh, 4 minutes 30 seconds a kilometer? There will be some hands up, huh? Yeah. Okay? And that is normally the number. So he is able to beat 99% of you. That is excellence. But affordable because it is so cheap. That's what one means by affordable excellence. So India has those genes to make it happen. So it is assured, all right? Because large number of lives are there. The other issue is in terms of disruptive innovation, it is about getting far more for far less for far more people, by the way, not for far more profit, okay? I call it MLM 2.0, more from less for more, 2.0. And this is the paper that we wrote on this subject, innovation's holy grail, getting more from less for more. Uh, this is now ranked among the top 10 must read papers, by the way, in uh, innovation. And those of you who are more interested, uh, you can see this uh, uh, breakthrough designs for ultra low cost products. There is a TED talk that I've given, which has uh, uh, these many views at 6 a.m. today. Oh, this is not 6 a.m. today, by the way, because I had posted this to you earlier. Today morning I looked at it, it is 6,29,685. So this is the latest. But basically those of you who are interested on how this can be achieved, it is uh, this. In order to do that, finally, what do we need? We need these fundamental changes. Supposing there is a new idea, Devang, and you want to discuss that. The traditional mindsets that will be there, first they will say, too risky. Second, they will say, 
Suppose it fails. We are always afraid of failure. Third, impossible, never done before. Arre, this didn't exist 20 years ago. It exists. <laughs> what do you mean by it never done before? Next, somebody has tried it already, confidently. And supposing you are scared, but you have good English, and you don't want to show that you are scared, you will say, oh, let me play David's Art Advocate. But what it means is a mindset that cannot make you do those five mantras that I talked about. So I always uh, say that if you are getting into brainstorming in a conference room, put these five outside and say that anybody who utters any of these will be out. Without that, you can't have this breakthrough. So you require those changes in terms of mindset. There are two definitions of innovators that I like. Innovation leader is one who does not know it cannot be done. Many oldies like me already know it can't be done. That's not done. Young people today don't know it can't be done, by the way. That gives us the hope, by the way. The second is innovation leader is one who sees what everybody else sees, but thinks of what nobody else thinks. Our education systems don't allow us to do the first as well as the second. I think that requires a fun, sort of fundamental uh, change. Innovation leaders are those who find opportunities where others see nothing, convert problems into an opportunity, and you have seen it time and again. They set quantum goals, not small goals. They drive discontinuity and bet on risky ideas. See, I've been doing my own science. My own science is based on risk. Uh, here is someone who is in my uh, domain area. There's a paper in current science that I've written, Chasing Anomalies and Discontinuities, the fun and joy of science, where normally, you know, you do experiments and there is an outlier and you tend to neglect it. I've chased those outliers all my life and created new science that is there in that current science. But as a science leader, betting on risky ideas, I remember in NCL, National Chemical Laboratory, I started what is called the Kite Flying Fund. 1% of my budget. Only 1% because otherwise I would have lost my job. Okay? On ideas, that will be out of the box. So it was like giving your permit, you know, saying that risk and no issue. The second one was when I went to CSR, I didn't want to call it kite flying because parliament is just one kilometer away. And they will say public fund being used for kite flying. So I called it new idea fund. Breakthroughs came. I remember Dr. Chandra Mohan having two US patents on spin computers 20 years ago. Can we just imagine? Of course, we didn't have the ecosystem to take it forward. That's a different matter altogether. And then at a national level, we create, created what is called the New Millennium Indian Technology Leadership Initiative. You are familiar with that, where we say take risks and so on and so forth. That is the culture we need to percolate. But then you will say, oh, what is it? You are talking about public funding and risking public funds. What about private sector? I'm very proud to tell you, private sector is doing it. Tata's. 2005, I remember Ratan had invited me to uh, Goa and uh, he had a meeting of all his senior leaders and I was asked to speak on innovation as a way of life. And I still remember saying uh, that uh, a friend of mine, a CEO from US had come and he was telling me, we don't hang people who make mistakes, but we do hang people who don't take risks. What do you do in India? I said, of course we hang people who take risks. And like this, there was a big laughter. There's one person who did not laugh, Ratan Tata. And during tea, he asked me, how do we promote risk taking in Tata's? I said, honor those who dare to try, but failed. And there came daring to try as uh, uh, the award that was instituted in 2006. That the most sought after award. And three, four years ago, I remember going to uh, Tata Motors uh, Innovation Day where there are three stalls. The first was, yes, we have done it. That means we have succeeded. The second is, we are at it. That means we have some hoary goals, but we are at it. And third, 
we tried but. For the first time I saw in India, people wearing failure with some pride. That's a cultural shift, as you can see. You can make those all across India. And it has to start from the family first, by the way. When your son wants to do a startup, he's trying to create a job, not seek a job. And the safe thing to do is to seek a job. From there, it has to actually start. The last one is first to India, to first to the world. You know, Professor Jain Narlikar has created this, uh, I mean, has a book called Scientific Age. And he lists the top 10 achievements of the 20th century of Indian science. I want you to see this and draw your own conclusions. What does he list? Of course, it is his personal choice. Depending upon who does it, it can differ. But this is a sample. He talks about Ramanujan. Yes, first to the word. He talks about Meghna Sahar, stellar astrophysics, changed because of his ionization equation. Talks about SN Bose. We know Boson and the Bose Einstein statistics, the particle strategy. Talks about CV Raman, the Nobel Prize winner. Jain Ramchandran, triple helix. All right. All were first to the world. That's what he lists in the first 50 years. In the second 50 years, he talks about atomic energy, green revolution, space program, some work on superconductivity that happened. And last one is the CSI transformation. Uh, during the time I was DG of CSR in late 90s. But these are all government supported public institutions. You don't see a single scientific breakthrough, which is first to the world. What happened? We used to do it in the first 50 years, Devan. What happened in the next 50 years? You do not see a single Apple, single Intel, single Microsoft, single anything. So now we are hoping that with this new generation, we'll make that change. We have started the Startup India movement. All right? There's a good news. The good news is here that there are a number of startups that are actually coming up now. Their valuations are increasing. All right? And you can see them moving from 100 million to $5 billion. That's a great news. OK? But there is a but here. You look at Flipkart, you look at Snapdeal, you look at Paytm, you look at Ola, they are big successes. Which one of them are truly first to the world? They are clones. But what they have done is a great job, which is to use it for India, Indian population, Indian applications, Indian environment, no doubt about that. But where is it that we are going to have something that will be first to the world. And that is why today you must have seen in the newspapers the startup policy that you talked about. All right. I uh, did co-chair this with the minister. And basically, we have tried to create a policy by which you know those big changes will take place. I don't want to get into the detail, but want to just emphasize one fundamental issue before white close. I think the key drivers for making that happen is talent. Second is technology, and third is trust. Trust is most important. We do have the talent, we do have the technology. It's the trust that matters. And let me illustrate that. I remember meeting uh, Bill Gates uh, about eight or nine years ago. I don't know what I'm talking to him about, but he's listening carefully. So I must be saying something sensible. I remember the discussion that we had. And this, had, this was about this. He narrated a very interesting story. You know what was that? Uh, I mean, there was a dinner come discussion. We had Anand Mahindra, Nandan Nilikani, and uh, uh, two, three others. So he told us about a Harvard University had invited him to give the commencement lecture. In that commencement lecture, he declared himself to be the most successful dropout from Harvard, which he was. But then he narrated an incident where he said, uh, you know, um, uh, there was a company in Albuquerque who were going to manufacture hardware. Those were early days of computers. So he phoned them up and said, I will give you the software. And he told us, he half expected they will keep the phone down. They did not. They said, come after a month. 
And he said, thank God they said come after a month because I did not have the software that I was offering them. Trust. First, they had trust in a young boy. And second, he had a trust in himself. How do we develop that? In fact, India's problem is not budget deficit. If you ask me, it is trust deficit at different levels. So we have to move from that great trust. This is a myth that Indian genes express in Silicon Valley, not in Indus Valley. The reality is that given challenge, they can express themselves here. And I can give you innumerable experience. I talked about Simputer that was launched. What was Simputer? The work, it was way ahead of its time. It had accelerometer, by the way, which was used in iPhone when it was launched in 2007. It had features, basically, which have been used in Samsung Galaxy, right? way ahead of time. In fact, we don't have to certify it. Bruce Sterling, New York Times Magazine said, the most significant innovation in computer technology in 2001 was not Apple's gleaming titanium power bag G4 or Microsoft's Windows XP. It was a computer, a netlink, radically simple, portable computer intended to bring the computer revolution to the third world. All right? That's where we were, ahead of the rest of the world. In fact, somebody who understands this, I'm not an expert in the area, has told me that if this was taken forward, we could have been leaders, world leaders. We would have been China, by the way. It did not happen. Why? Because all these letters, it was affordable, U, R, E, D, everything, but it could not scale, sustain, because there was something that was missing, which was a bold, innovative, public procurement policy for and of innovation. I think that is very critical. What happens is that in other countries, you have this bold policy. I remember seven, eight years ago in Beijing, I think 10 years ago, in Beijing, there was a Global Inclusive Innovation Summit. I gave the opening plenary, and the lady who followed me was the Vice Minister of Science and Technology, China. And she said last year, the public procurement support that we gave to indigenous innovation was close to a trillion yuan, divided by six and you will get dollars. And every other country has such a public procurement policy. So what happens is that government becomes the first buyer. So supposing when Simputer had come, an order for 10,000 was placed. All right, all the beta testing would have been done, all right, customer feedback, this, that, and the other, etc. and it would have become market ready, okay? So there was this big discussion on how do we sort of move on that. And therefore now the policies are getting changed. You will see that in this policy, by the way. These elements have been incorporated. And at a national level, we are trying to do that because in Niti Aayog, a couple of months ago, again, I chaired a brainstorming session on India at 75. Today we are India at 70. India at 75. What would it be? Okay, and they were leaders, and there was one comment that came, because as you know, I chaired the Swachh Bharat Technology Expert Committee, where we look at technologies which are available, affordable, accessible, scalable, sustainable, rapidly deployable, socially acceptable, and so on. We give them the best. But somebody said, what's the use of Machine Learning Committee? Because when we go for those technologies, we have to opt for L1, the lowest. Okay, so how do you take a decision for uh, uh, something that is technologically superior and all that? And therefore, I have done this paper now, uh, Innovative Public Procurement Policy for Fueling Assured Inclusive Innovation. Uh, Niti Aayog is publishing a book called The Path Ahead, Anthology of Transformative Ideas for India where this will be sort of appearing. And I do hope, like at the state level, at national level, these policies will come up. I'm very happy to say that in Startup India initiative that the government of India has taken, already these public procurement policies, some of the elements sort of feature there, but they must uh, pervade all walks, not just uh, the startups. Finally, I'll always like to end with the good news, by the way. I've given you a lot of bad news in the good news but end with the good news, and that is uh, the commitments. One of the finest day, finest evening of my life was this. You know what is this evening? You can see here a book getting released. That book is on innovation. And this is the last official act 
of the outgoing president, Sri Pranam Mukherjee. Okay? And you can see here our prime minister, the incoming president, the current president, the vice president, Professor Anil Gupta, who is actually the driver behind all grassroots innovation movement. And I'm there in my capacity as chairman of National Innovation Foundation who created that book. So if the last formal act of the president, outgoing president of India, you know, is release of a book, and he was very proud of it, I just met him in Ahmedabad, then I think that is something that actually can be counted. So if this happens at the national level, this happens at the state level, I think we are on. The last point, summarizing, I would say we have to create a world-class innovation ecosystem, which will mean it must comprise physical, intellectual, and cultural. Culture is very important. For that, we require critical innovation support systems, like education research institutions, like the IITs that we talk about, incubators which are coming up, accelerators that are coming up, technology parks that are coming up, and not venture capital, adventure capital. Because our venture capital tends to be vulture capital. All right? We require early stage financing, nascent ideas, and so on. Then the government and the society and the institutions, public procurement policies, robust IPR regimes, balanced regulatory systems, strategically designed standards, then we can hope to have innovation rate accelerated growth and India as a leader in assured innovation. All right? Now, my dream is of course that make in India is not just assembled in India. All right. We have to discover, innovate, and deliver in India. The smartphones that we carry, iPhones, are manufactured in China. By whom? By Foxconn. How many jobs does it create? 4.5 million jobs. How much money does Foxconn take away? $10 per iPhone sold. How much does Apple take away? $350. $10, $350. So India has three choices. First. Sweat it out, get $10, but 4.5 million jobs. Third, go a little below, think, create, innovate, get $350, but not many jobs, few techie jobs. But the third is, take that $10, take that $350. That's what I mean by discover, innovate, and make in India. So when I got the Jayati Tata, So when I got the Jayadi Tata Corporate Leadership Award in 1998, in my final speech, I had said, talked about all this. This was 1998, means uh, long many years ago. And I had said, it is only this innovative India that will signal to the rest of the world that we are not a hesitant nation, unsure of our place in the new global order, but a confident one that is raring to go and be a leader in the Committee of Nations. Thank you very much. I think, uh, it is like this. See, we are having a paradigm shift now, because there also the change will have to occur. How did we start? Learning by rote. From there, learning by creating. Or, sorry, learning by doing. Learning by doing means what? Our teachers said step one, step two, step three, step four, and we followed step one, step two, step three, step four. That was learning by doing. To learning by creating, right? Creating something new. That is where we are in our Prime Minister's Innovation Council, you know, we had talked about Thor Four Jod centers. So that children are allowed to. That's what you do, basically, in your center. Of course, this government has come with tinkering labs. Basic concept is same. In Maharashtra also we are creating tinkering labs so that children will be able to do that. So learning by doing, I mean, uh, learning by road to learning by doing to learning by creating. Now it is learning by co-creating. And co-creating not with man and man, or a man and woman, but man and machine. We don't talk about robots anymore, cobots, cooperative robots. So I think the new education system will have to 
actually teach this on how to excel by learning the art of co-creation. While also having the personal attributes like emotional intelligence, like dealing with complexity, uh, critical thinking, creativity, all right? I think these are the new qualities that we have to imbibe. And if you use these and look at our current education system and see which of those are imbibed, I think there are big question marks. So it requires sort of a big, uh, I would say, change and a revolution. Any other Yeah. Yeah, good morning. Um, one thing that's been troubling me over many trips and visits to India and conversations with colleagues at IATB is in order to meet, make and create the products that meet the assured criterion, these are indigenous products, there's a huge gap one layer below. And those are the technologies, the components, the fabricators, and indeed the skills. And sometimes these are skills in the hands of people who don't even have college degrees, but that are necessary to get to the level where high quality products can be made here. And that's not really talked about in the Make in India, and even in the Skills India. So what can be done to bring this whole level of infrastructure up to the point where my colleagues here don't struggle to obtain optics, to obtain precision components, to obtain high quality reliable electronics that will allow them to then, and the students who graduate from here, to really create innovative indigenous Indian products? I think it's an excellent question. As a matter of fact, that you, know, you put your finger on the challenge that we have. That is why I always talk in terms of innovation ecosystem, where what IIT provides is just one part of that ecosystem, by the way. And finally, we will not succeed in the marketplace unless all these components, including the ones that you talk about, are fixed, basically. So therefore, in the innovation policies that we talk about, we create lots of policies in the execution that actually uh, sort of matters. So even in this policy, by the way, there is an execution which comprises all those components, because one missing component can finish you off out of all these uh, uh, individual components that we talk about. I think we have to learn that uh, uh, art. We have had some successes, but it is despite the ecosystem, somehow or the other, there was an individual motivation, this, that, and the other. I want it to be systematic, basically, so that it's put in place. And I don't uh, illustrate it by giving, uh, creating a hype by giving exceptions. It must, it must become a rule, and that can become the rule when we have the total innovation, robust ecosystem. And my last uh, slide, actually, when I talked about the total, you saw the elements of all these. Some of these are missing. You can't uh, make it happen. Yeah. So, Titus Sequera, uh, I have a two-part question. Uh, first of all, thank you for the insight, and it was amazing to hear. Uh, the question number one is, where we stand today as, as a united India is our pain points are somewhere else. We, we are, for example, our GDP, we have about 26% comes from, or it's gone to 17.8% on agriculture. Whereas we see the, the pain points there are never addressed. We are looking at technology development. I'm a technologist for 37 years. But what I see today is that what are our sweatshops we talked about is going to go away in the years to come because the world is changing toward more automation. So when we have 1.4 million jobs, kids coming out every year, we don't have positions for them. So when we talk about startup, how is startup looking at the industries that really bring money to the country, which is agriculture or the newer ones like uh, renewable energy? So how do, we, how do we give the message out that, hey, startup is great, but the right startups are more important? So the importance of farmers doesn't have to commit suicide, or we shouldn't embrace GMO, whatever those are. I mean, how do we bring those pieces of um, knowledge into what should a startup really do? Because we, we have no dearth of startups today in India. The problem is 95% of them fail because they can't go beyond the first step because they don't know the direction where we are going. Exceptions are never looked at, only rules are looked at. Let me create a solution, let's find a problem later. So those are some steps that I am struggling uh, to understand sure. where we could think of. Thank yeah. you. No, again, an excellent uh, question, something uh, that keeps us awake. I think there are both internal and external factors. Internal is internal motivation. 
to be useful to the society to solve the problem that they have. We talk about startups, all right? There's a new mindset that is coming up, by the way. I'll answer all your question in full detail, but this gives me an opportunity to what I did not cover. There's a new generation that is emerging, which is of a very different kind. I interact very closely with young people. Six, seven months ago, I was talking to a group of young people. And the title of my talk was Satyam Shivam Sundaram. Satya Nadela, the CEO of Microsoft. Sundar Pichai, CEO of Google. So I said, there is a vacancy. Shiva, maybe Apple's CEO. One young boy got up. You know, this is the characteristic of the young generation. Very respectful. So he says, sir. He called me sir. But he says, sir, you don't understand us. I said, what do you mean? I thought I'm, I was inspiring you to become. He said, no, sir. Your generation, your only dream was to go to US somehow. The next generation, they said, we must go to US but get a great job. Microsoft, Google, Apple. Next generation said, no, we must go to US, not only get a job in Microsoft, but become CEO. He said, not my generation. We want to create our own Microsofts or our own Google here in India. <laughs> so that is the generation that we have since we talk about startups. So you must see where they come from. That's number one. Number two, the three startups that I showed to you, basically, what were they trying to do? Five rupee ECG, 10 rupee hemoglobin, one dollar cancer test, who are they working for? For the society. So they are the people who are not saying, I will do well and then I will do good, like Bill Gates did very well and then created the foundation. Right? No issue on that. They say we will do well by doing good. That means doing good itself is a business. So Mir Shah, when I show you, he is going to go to 25 countries, 500 million women, Basically, he's saying, yes, I will make money, but I'll make sure that early detection with $1 screening is done and they are saved. That is the new generation. So therefore, internally, I believe there are three qualities. Innovation up there, yes, our young kids are very innovative. Passion, yes, compassion. Innovation, compassion, and passion. I think that is where it has to start. Now, once that compassion comes, they start looking at the problems. Agriculture being just one of them, you know. I think there will not be any technology, I mean any field, which will not be affected by those 10 exponential technologies that I talked about, particularly with rapidly dropping costs. And how do we creatively use them, I think is the issue, basically, all right. And I'm finding, because I deal with them, um, for example, I'm very deeply involved in startups. I have my own startups, by the way. Basically, even at the age of 75, <laughs> I said, so I have two, Wine Bioscience and Invictus, uh, uh, two, you know, there is a supramolecular therapeutics in uh, Invictus where we are dealing with some breakthrough technology. So I'm enjoying that. But I also chair uh, venture capital companies and so on. So one of them is Gen Next Ventures. This year we had 1900 applications out of which we chose 16, just last month. But if you scan those 1900, they touch on all the topics that you talk about on their own, you know, including agriculture, by the way. So I think we are having a community now of young people, you know, who just don't want to become rich, but also contribute to the society. That is my hope. What a policy like this does is to help them. For example, we said public procurement policy is a great challenge. You know, this policy is so bold. They have made it mandatory that 10% of the procurement from government departments has to be from startups. There you are. Okay? There are so many other things by which they have tried to make them hassle free. And then they have identified those areas, including social entrepreneurship we want to promote, you know, biotechnology which uh, sort of works uh, for uh, everyone, and given them sort of uh, uh, special treatment, so as to say incentivizing that, actually. So I think it is a pull and a push. Both will be required, basically. I, you know, I, I must tell you something. I have the reputation of being a dangerous optimist. 
all right? And I'm very optimistic, very frankly, that you will see the change, and sooner rather than later. Because many of those things that are presented, you would not have imagined. Like the way India has kind of jumped. Nobody would have imagined. Nobody would have given us a chance that we become number one in, in, in this way. Right? Of course, it required bold leadership. Of course, it required deep pockets, but it also required guts. You know, because if you do calculations on the basis of current consumption, you will never invest $18 billion. You have to look at the future and invest. So I think it's a combination of large number of uh, things that have actually happened. So you see a new emerging India, you know, at different levels. Uh, and I, 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 I find it the, probably the most exciting. I feel sorry I'm 75. I wish I was 25, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because the, the real new India is happening now. Take my word for it. Uh, sir, I am Rajul. Uh, here, sir. We'll have a last oh, yeah, question yeah. now. Yeah. Sir, I am Rajul, I, IIT student and also a founder of a star agricultural startup. Mike, I think if I have not understood, maybe I have not understood your prop thing properly. You said don't depend on the government initial, I mean, initially for scaling, scalable and sustainable. I, I feel my product is assured. But then in the last example of Simputer, which I also happened to use it, uh, 20 years back, uh, is that you said if government would have placed an order for 10,000, maybe Simputer would not have died. So I feel a contradiction. Not There's depend, no contradiction. So not depend on the government, but at the same time you feel that no. government should place an order for 10,000 no. systems. I, I, I think uh, uh, offline we can talk and I'll explain to you, but there is no contradiction. Okay. What I'm saying is that any business that you create finally should not depend upon the crutches. That's what I mean. For example, Simputer. Government places the order for first 10,000. All the testing is done, consumer feedback, perfection of the product, etc. It becomes market ready. Yeah. And once it is market ready, once they start sorry, they can't then depend on the government. It has to be standalone business, by yeah. the way. Yeah, but the initial 10,000 or 1,000 systems, if Simputer would have got, Simputer would have been there, right? No, no, no. <laughs> Basically, what happens, you know, See, idea is like a seed, okay? You plant it, you have to have a soil which is conducive to growth, but it requires inputs. It requires fertilizers, it requires water and so on and so forth. Then it grows. Then it grows into a tree and that is where you take the fruits of innovation, that is the fruit. In that initial phase, you require support. That is the point I am trying to make. Without that, it can't go into a tree. You understand? It is not government, 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 government all the way. I mean, our tendency is such that even if the tap in our home is leaking, we say, what is the government doing about it? That's what I'm saying. Okay, sir. You got it now? Yes, sir. Yeah, good. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And uh, it set the right tone for today's proceeding. So now I request uh, Professor Kakkar, Director of IIT Bombay, to present memento to Dr. Mashelkar as a token of appreciation. Thanks.